Sunday, November 3rd, in the year 2024. This, this service is, as is our tradition, our communion service. For those who are listening to the recording, I would invite you to, at some point, pause listening to the service and gather the elements of communion so that within the direction of this recording, you too can be united around this, the Lord's table. For those within our church, we continue. Our call to worship is taken from Psalm 146, selected verses and adapted for worship. We will read it responsibly as printed in the bulletin. I invite you to now stand for the call to worship. Happy are those who are helped by God. Their hope is in the Lord their God. God our name and earth, the sea and everything in it. God remains loyal forever. God does what is fair for those who have been wronged and gives food to the hungry. The Lord gives up people who are in trouble and loves those who do the right. God protects the foreigners and defends the widows and orphans. The Lord, the Lord will be king forever, for our God is a last Praise God. Come, let us worship that God. with our praise, 
because we come as grateful children. We want to especially praise you and thank you because over recent days and weeks, there are several within our church family that have experienced excellent medical care, diagnosis, treatment, and anticipated treatment. And so it's with praise and thanksgiving we give, we remember these people and ask continued prayers of healing, grace, and empowerment, as well as especially your loving presence. Therefore, by name, we lift up Louisa, Irene, and Jeff. Lord, hear our prayer. And as your children, we are not naive to our world. So we continue to simply pray for peace, for justice, for wisdom that would guide leaders to healing the fractures and the torment of war and rumors of war, of natural disasters, of illnesses and plagues. Therefore, we pray, pray for peace and your abiding presence to continue to be manifested powerfully and that individuals, especially leaders, would have ears and eyes to hear and respond. Lord, yeah. and we want to be faithful and persistent for those within our church family that have long-standing illnesses, treatment, that have courage as they continue to live out their lives faithfully before you. And just a few of these are Dory, Tyler, Judy C., and Teddy. Bless these individuals, reveal your love as we pray for healing and empowerment in their lives, that they would know you are with you, you are with them. Lord, you are praying. thank you for hearing our prayer. Thank you not only, Jesus, for hearing our prayers, but to receiving our words and then delivering our prayers perfectly to the ears of our Father in Heaven as you intercede for us. The continued love and care that you provide for us, your family, your brothers and sisters, those that you love in a special way, continue to fill us with awe and also empowers our lives so that we would reflect your truth as we are your followers. We unite now our hearts as we speak your prayer your thought you taught your original 12 disciples when together we say our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil lies the kingdom we continue in our worship with the giving of our gifts as we invite our ushers to come forward. We all have our routines different avenues of delivering our gifts to the empowerment of this church, its mission both here and around the world, as well as other worthy causes, as we are moved to be generous and return just a portion of the resources that you've entrusted to our care. Remind us so that over and over again, we will be joyful givers. Remind us as over and over again, we know that your grace and your resources are always and abundant and always sufficient as we mindfully bring our gifts as an act of worship to you. Your blessings, your pleasure, as we seek to give in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Uh -huh.
Tuesday at 11 o'clock. Do you know where you'll be next Tuesday at 11 o'clock? Some of us know. We're going to be here at the church. We're going to be gathered around the table. And we will gather for two purposes. Three, really. One, we will have conversation about the passage that Jeff will have selected for next Sunday sermon. So we study and we have conversation. Number two, we support each other through prayer and by sharing, which means overall we're experiencing spiritual fellowship as we gather, 
And last, our stomachs will be nourished because each one of us brings a lunch or has a lunch and we have the fellowship of food. I'm citing this because this is a standing program that we have had for decades. I'll just leave it at that. Why am I reviewing this? Number one, for those who are listening, regardless of where you live, if you would like a link so that you could join us by Zoom, we send that out every single week. And I invite you to find our webpage and find out the link. And Amy Broderick, who just read the scriptures, will send you, put your name on the email, and you will get the link. So isn't that a wonderful thing? And by the way, there are two people with a history with our church, one from Virginia and the other from Marshfield, who are regular participants in this meeting. The other reason why I share is that what I, the phrase I use to describe our Bible study is conversational Bible study. Conversational Bible study. I oftentimes will ask questions. And most of the time, when I ask the question, silence. The reason is either I ask a poor question, or I ask a question and nobody knows the answer. And then there are times, because collectively our biblical knowledge has grown, I'll ask a question and almost all of us know the answer. The most important question. The most important answer. That's the kind of setting that we see in the lesson, isn't it? Jesus has asked a question. Well, in order for us to put this in a larger context, it's important to take a look at the verses just before the verses that were read for our lesson today to see the dynamics that were going on. Question and answer. Question and answer is a method of learning, isn't it? And especially in the Jewish tradition, conversation, talking about, debating, is as old as the establishment of synagogues, which goes back literally 3,000 years ago. Getting together and talking about scriptures, having conversation, asking questions, and reply. However, the content, the dynamics of the passage in the lesson, or reflected in the lesson, is, as I'll point out, very different than just before. There was a group called the Sadducees, and I'm not going to get into all the differences, but basically, by the time of intertestimonial period, the religious leaders oftentimes were also political leaders, okay? And they held to various doctrines that distinguish them, the Sadducees from the Pharisees, to the Levites, to the, etc. Okay? We're not going to get into in depth, but they engaged Jesus in a debate, intentionally trying to trick him up. In our political climate, and I'm not talking about politics, because this happens all the time, sometimes interviewers ask a question because they really want to know information, right? And sometimes they ask questions of the political candidates, regardless of what level. It could be the uh, running for the Board of Education in Hingham, right? They ask a question hoping to have a gotcha question. A question. I gotcha because you're not prepared to answer and you don't know. I got you because you hold to a position that's not the popular question, right? You know what I'm talking about here, right? Gotcha questions? Well, the Sadducee question and answer engaged in a debate with Jesus, and they posed a gotcha question. Why? Because the Sadducees held to the position that they did not believe in the resurrection. Now, what am I referring to with the resurrection? The general resurrection of the dead to life in the world to come. They didn't believe in the world to come. They believed and they taught as their political and religious teaching is, when you die, you just die, and everything's done. No more. Jesus knew their position. But they posed a legal question. And they asked Jesus 
that according to the law, consider this hypothetical question. And to this day, sometimes you'll, have, you'll hear conversations about the law and hypotheticals, right? And so, any, so they're asking Jesus, and they have this situation. Jesus, according to the law of Moses, if in a family one brother who's married dies, and he and his wife do not have children, particularly they don't have a son, then another brother is obliged by the law to marry the widow. In fact, that was the law of Moses. So it's a hypothetical. But then they carried it further. And this I won't go into a lot of detail, but basically they said there were, it ends up there were seven brothers, the first to the seventh, all married this woman, <laughs> and they all died before she dies. Okay? Pretty extraordinary hypothetical, isn't it? But then they crown it off. That's the law. They're citing the law. So there's no debate and no argument about the law. But then they cite it, and they go, whose wife is she in the world to come? In the resurrection. Ooh. Again, they wanted to have a gotcha question. How in the world would Jesus ever possibly answer this question? And it, this reads like a script, so I'm going to read it straight out of Scripture. Verses 24, chapter 12 of Mark, verses 24 through 27. Here's, that was the setting. And Jesus replied, You are in error. Whoa. Established leaders in Jerusalem. Jesus is a young itinerant rabbi. He gets asked a question, a hypothetical, and his first response is, you're in error. Because you don't know scriptures. This is not a, what they thought was a softball question that was going to raise a bit debate and get Jesus in a place where they were going to prove he's not really that strong a rabbi. You know, he not, he's not as he might be popular, but he doesn't really know his stuff. They're trying to always test Jesus, right? And they think they have the upper hand, and he turns around and their response is, you're in error. Why? Because you don't understand scriptures. Or the power of God. Not only don't you understand scriptures, you don't even understand how powerful the God is that we worship. And by the way, in the context, remember something. Biblically, monotheism was the absolutely minority position. Polytheism was the way to go with almost all the other international and national religions of the day. So even the fact that Israel stands up and says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one, and you will have no other God. We forget how radical that is, because that's just been incorporated into what we are taught and what we believe. But even identifying that was, was amazing. And so they're sitting, he's sitting, and re he's responding and saying, you're an error. Not only don't you know scripture, you don't even know God and God's power. Not a comfortable situation. And, but he continues. When the dead rise, I declare the sentence that yes, there is life after death. When the dead rise, they will neither marry nor be given in marriage. Why? Because in heaven, they're like angels. There's no need for a marriage because there's no ongoing procreation. It just is. And so it's an irrelevant question. Now about the dead rising. So again, their tentative faith, the doctrine that the Sadducees held to is there's no life after death. There's no life in the world to come. So now we talked about marriage, we dismissed that. It's irrelevant. It's not a good question. And we're going to continue. Now about the dead rising. Have you not read the book of Moses? What's the book of Moses? It's the law. It's the Torah. It's the first five chapter, five books of quote unquote the Jewish Bible. It's the core that they especially studied. The prophets and the Psalms were important, but it was the Torah that got the attention that was most often studied in the synagogue. Have you not read the book of Moses? Again, strong language in response. 
In, account of the, in the account of the burning bush, in the account of the burning bush, now, right away, and I won't ask you to raise your hands, but in your mind and in your heart, do you have a little idea about the narrative in and around the burning bush? Yeah? That's pretty familiar, isn't it? To this day, we've learned about that. We learned about the special calling that Moses, with all the details of his life that were so special, i.e. the being born at a time that he is surviving as an infant at the basket in the, in the Nile and being raised in Pharaoh's family, etc., 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 and also Moses, whose temper and rage and his anger at the injustice that was being demonstrated by the slave driver, that he is a murderer. Okay, and then that St. Moses goes to the land of Midian and spends 40 years there. Okay, he's not a young man. And he's out tending sheep, and then he sees the burning bush that isn't consumed. And he's curious, so he goes and investigates. And what is the experience? In today's language, one of the most dynamic God moments in all the history of humanity. Moses, I got a job for you. Of course, he argued with God, didn't want to accept the job, but ultimately, as we know, <coughs> became the leader that led the nation we started off as slaves and became a nation as they followed Moses into the desert, wandered around for 40 years, and then entered the promised land. Moses. It doesn't get any bigger in the history of Israel than Moses. Have you not read the book of Moses in the account of the burning bush and how God said to him, I am the God of Abraham. The God of Isaac. The God of Jacob. Patriarch, right? The people of Abraham. They trace their roots back to, and in now thousands of years after the experience that Moses had with the burning bush, as reported in the scripture, Jesus is citing that historic fact, and even at that point, Abraham, Jacob, and Isaac had been dead for a long time. And basically his premise is, is God the God of the living or the God of the dead? And of course, the answer is, well, God of the living. Well, there's life in the world to come. He's not the God of the dead, but the living. You are badly mistaken. Took care of that? Not in a prideful way. But why? Because Jesus was inspired. And Jesus, through the Holy Spirit and through his learning in the course of his life, true, understood the true meaning of the narratives that had been passed on from generation to generation. He understood the very nature of God. And as he revealed, I understand God. Because I am God in human form. Which, if you were not, that is the most blasphemous declaration that anybody could possibly proclaim, because in essence he's saying, I am God. So these are dynamics that, again, we want to remind ourselves. Public ministry, Jesus as a rabbi teaching, this was not an easy path for him to follow. And it was God's spirit and God's wisdom that guided him to know what to teach, how to respond, and how to engage with what? Questions and answers. Badly mistaken. Think for a moment. Our, the lesson that we have, it starts out with this simple statement. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debate. So you can kind of picture a cluster. We don't know exactly where they were, but there's a cluster of leaders of Jesus in the midst of them, the 12 disciples. I mean, we're talking about, they, they weren't always with Jesus all the time, but we're talking about a significant gathering, little, little um, cohort, right? Conversation and debating. And this is a normal way of teaching and having an exchange. That's the methodology that was used. It was used in the synagogues. It was used in the temple courts, because we know Jesus taught there. It was used in multiple places. So there are times Jesus preached, like the Sermon on the Mount, and there are other times 
All these cohorts were organically shaped in conversation, whether in a home or out in a field or any on multiple locations. And so this teacher of the law is walking along and hey, there's something going on over here. I think I'll go take a look. And he goes and he's there close enough and he got the gist of it. We don't know exactly where he, he stepped into the conversation, but he heard Jesus' response and he thought to himself, wow, that rabbi that Jesus of Nazareth just gave a very wise statement. He heard them debating, noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer. He asked him. Now, again, the Sadducees are there with a gotcha question. They're trying to trip up Jesus. And now the teacher of the law hears, and we know it because it's recorded, in his heart seat going, oh, this is a wise, wise answer. I have my question. But do we know the nature of this leader's question? And that's what we're exploring today. Of all the commandments, which is the most important? Whenever you use an adjective like most, it elevates it, doesn't it? What do you like most? What passage do you like most of the Bible? Yeah. Even simple things like, well, what's your favorite piece of music? What's the most important to you? Or, what book did you read that had the most significance in your life? Or what experience became the most for you? You know, it's, 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 most of the time we go blank. It's kind of like going back to Gary asks a question and everybody goes blank. The most? Oh my goodness. <laughs> I heard an interview recently, and they asked that kind of most question. What's the most significant musical album that you, that you hold the highest in all your life? And they, and they actually began by diverting and didn't answer the question. And then later, as the interview continued, they turned around and said, okay, here's my answer, but it's not one, it's three. <laughs> right? The most. That, that's like setting up. That's a tough one, isn't it? So he asked him, what's the most important? In this setting, in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus just answers the question. In another setting, as recorded in a different Gospel, Jesus turns the question on the question, well, how do you read the text? And in that setting, the person answered the exact same answer that Jesus offered. And I shared that to realize that this may have been fairly commonly understood. It wasn't a trick question, but he's reviewing with Jesus of saying what's been taught, and it has been taught, that this is the most important teaching of all the laws of Moses. And again, many of us, if we ask this question, what is the greatest commandment that Jesus ever, that was ever revealed to, through Moses? We might have had an idea, because when we hear it, love God with all your heart and all your mind and all your soul, and the second is like the first, love your neighbor as yourself. We go, yeah, that's real familiar. Well, it's a quote from Deuteronomy. So this is not like on the edge or fringe, like life in the world to come. It's more, well, it has yet to happen, and we don't know really when all of a sudden all that much about it, but Jesus did give a good answer. <clears throat> Most important. And so instead of turning the question back on the questioner, Jesus just quoted and gave the an answer. And then listen to what the teacher of the law, what they responded with. Well said, teacher. You are right in saying that God is one, again, monotheism, the foundation of Judaism, and that there is no other God, fidelity to God, and that we are called to love him with all our heart, with all our understanding, and with all our strength. And to love our neighbor as ourself, as yourself. Why is it significant that this teacher of the law repeated back to Jesus exactly what Jesus had just said? And my position today that I'm reinforcing this 
because the teaching, the word that Jesus shared, landed. It resonated within this man to the point that he then in turn said, yes, that's what I believe too. And he restated it in his own words, but reflecting is already this man as a teacher, but as a follower of Judaism, had had that truth in his heart. It was already there. But then he adds something that is most interesting. What is most important? Love God, love your neighbor, the details we've just shared. Not only is that important, but it's more important that all of the burnt offerings that we give, all of the ritual, all of the practice of religion that year in and year out, week in and week out, that individuals who are followers of, of the law it surpasses all of that. The very law and the practice of the law that he dedicated his life to, this teaching is the most important period. So that it's clear, he knew the facts, he understood the application, and he further had lived out that application. Why? Because Jesus said, you are not far from the kingdom. See, it was not a gotcha question. It was, I want to engage in and make a connection with you, one teacher to another teacher, one Jew to another Jew, about what is truly the essence of our being faithful and following God. And the exchange landed. Facts and details are just that. And we all have collected a certain number of data, details, and facts, and, and many of us have remembered, and we, we've studied scripture, and maybe we've memorized quite a few verses in scripture. I've shared over and over again, because it's as true as saying that I'm here what week and I'm standing before you today, is I don't easily remember scripture. And I, there are passages of scripture I have memorized, <coughs> but I will share I have hidden God's word in my heart. And, and it's a living word. And I seek to, on a daily basis, live as guided by the teachings that I read in Scripture, that I hear, not only with my ears, but also what has filtered from the physical receiving of a message as it lands on my, the audio lands on my physical ear, into my head and has been processed and rest in my heart. And that's the driving force of how I want to live day in and day out. What's the most important teaching? I believe the most important is the Word. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word <coughs> created all that's been created. The Word became flesh through Jesus Christ. So that when Jesus taught, as guided by the Holy Spirit during his mortal, finite teaching ministry on earth, his words and his teachings reflected God's truth and God's teaching. And sometimes it was by quoting Deuteronomy. And oftentimes we see it's in this engagement of conversation with individuals where Jesus and this teacher exchanged what they exchanged in this passage. And Jesus knew because of the testimony that the living word had landed, filtered through the man's thinking, through, filtered through the man's training, filtered through what it means to be a human being to hear the word proclaimed to the point of, this is what I believe. This is my guiding principle. The word became flesh through Jesus. The word continues to be flesh. Why? Because whenever we share about our faith, in this case, my opportunity as pastor to preach from this passage of scripture, to lift up the principle of the word, that you as listeners, 
as brothers and sisters in Christ, you receive this word, and it either makes sense to you, and then it is filtered into your life, your heart, your whole being, mind, body, and spirit, or not. Because no matter what, religion is not about collecting data points. It's not about being religious, of offering sacrifices, of going through the motions, of the number of times that we attend a worship service in a given month, of the technical aspect. Are we literally doing the tithe 10 percent, or are we giving out of love and seeking always to give generously and to truly love our neighbor? And again, we know this is the context where it continues, where again, they didn't ask it in this setting at this time, but in another setting, Jesus spoke to these two primary commandments, and then the follow-up question was what? Oh, by the way, teacher, who's my neighbor? Data? Question? Do you know what the next teaching was? The parable of the Good Samaritan. Who loved, the, who loved the Samaritan, the, the person beaten up and left to die on the highway? Not the ones that walked down by, but the one who stopped and took care of her. But no, even in that story, the hated Samaritans, we won't get into that, but it was known. He had the resources to do what he had. Jesus doesn't ask us to do what we can't do, but Jesus teaches us not to just walk on by when we see people who need help. When we see opportunities to engage in conversation and to learn, to grow, to fan the flame in each other's lives. This is when the Word, the Word was created, the Word became flesh. Jesus taught the Word as he walked on the face of the earth, and the Word reflects obedience even to death for Jesus. And that word was written down. And we call it our Bible. The Bible that we read from, whether it's printed out from Bible Gateway, or it's in the version that we have in pews, that word, special, absolutely. It's inanimate, folks. Did I pronounce that right? Inanimate? And it's not alive. But when we hear the word through our reading, our audibly hearing, process through our thinking, Jesus, God said, come, let us reason together. And then we internalize the truth and it guides our lives. That's when God's word comes alive. What's the most important? The word. Amen.
disciples with the instructions to do this in remembrance of me. Therefore, we celebrate this to remember what Jesus did. We celebrate this to demonstrate outwardly what we already hold to be true in our lives and in our hearts as followers of Jesus. We use Jesus' words. He first took bread. Bread is the source of life. Without bread and water, we would not survive. Bread being food. He took the bread. He broke the bread. And then he prayed to God, asking God to bless that physical bread using these words. This is my body, which is broken for you. Broken into many parts as we ask God's blessing so that by eating of this bread, we become one. On this day, in remembrance of all that Jesus accomplished, we celebrate the bread of life. Many parts become one. Amen. <laughs> Jesus' blood as that sacrifice 
is to cleanse all the sins of anyone who follows him. We fall short of the glory of God. Our God is gracious. We seek to reflect a new life. And we know that part of the way that we are renewed is to surrender our lives as your followers and you obediently follow you. Our obedience becomes our sacrifice. But we are utterly dependent on your sacrifice for the forgiveness of sins. Your blessings as we partake of this, the blood of Jesus. Amen. Oh, 
peace of Christ that transcends all human understanding. Guard.